Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction and welcome, Mayor, to, to, uh, to Bloomberg. And thank you very much for coming to talk to us. Um, and, and welcome to you all to, to Bloomberg. It's, uh, it's a while since I did an in-person event, so this is, uh, this is a special thrill this morning. So welcome to the Bloomberg Sustainable uh, Business Summit. We have 20 minutes of conversation up here on the stage and then there is time to ask questions. There's a, a, there's a, a process for asking questions through the app, so please do do that and we can get any questions you have too to the mayor this morning. So it's interesting that we're just uh, starting our conversation, um, Sadiq, just on the back of that poll and that question about how the current news, the, dredge, uh, the, the, the dreadful events we're seeing, the war in Ukraine, clearly that is a humanitarian crisis there and beyond. It's also a cost of living crisis. It's turning into one in, in very many parts of the world. And so that has many people asking, does that delay our transition to cleaner energies? Does it, uh, does it hinder it or does it make us double down and, and speed up? I'd just be interested, as you've set tough targets for London, yeah. how you feel about that. Well, look, first, first thing, Arizona, it's been a while since I've done it. I've done an in-person event and I'm told the first thing you're supposed to do is check if Will Smith's around. Yeah. <laughs> and if he's not, you can chillax. But look, it's, it's, look, it's, uh, I don't uh, make those kind of jokes, so <laughs> we should be safe. It's, uh, no, look, I, I, I think, I think there, there's a number of responses to what's happening in uh, Ukraine with uh, Putin's uh, barbaric aggression. One of those is to think that gives us a, a clean pass to do more exploration for gas and oil to begin fracking and so forth. The other, the other response is the one I think you see from those who responded to the polls, both in the room and on Twitter, which actually, this should accelerate uh, you know, the, the speed with which you get to renewables, to, to solar and wind, which is actually cheaper, but actually it reminds us that actually energy security is really important. Yes, of course, tackling climate change is really, really important. Getting to zero carbon is really important, but actually energy security is really important as well. You can't have a situation where, you know, Germany is going cap in hand uh, to, to Russia or our Prime Minister is going to Saudi or elsewhere to have more hydrocarbons. And I think, you know, the invasion of Ukraine should make us even more keen to get to zero carbon, should make us even more keen to, you know, make the adaptations and uh, invest in renewables. Okay. And I think actually... It is a wake-up call to those of us in the global north. OK, so it's useful to set our conversation in that reality. And, uh, you know, day in and day out, we're, we're hearing about this kind of news and yeah. reporting on this kind of news. So it's important to sort of check in with you on that. Um, the pathway to net zero, then, you've set targets for 2030 for London. Uh, so the, these targets are coming closer, aren't they? Uh, which, is, which, is, which is really fascinating to see how, how well we can do on that front. Let me start by asking, <coughs> then, go through a few areas. And one, is, one, of them is, one of those is the built environment and buildings and what we do about that. Of course, everybody wants to see better insulation and different energy sources in people's homes. But how how realistic are the uh, the targets you set on that front? Because who pays for all of that? What is your assessment of who pays for better insulating Londoners' homes? Yeah, well, look, if you break it down, there are three basic areas where you have carbon emissions. One is transport, one is where people work, and one is where people live. Now, we're lucky. We're in probably the greenest building in the world, this building. But, but, uh, and you can do that when you're starting from scratch. Um, but we've got a big issue in relation to retrofitting mm. buildings and how we uh, travel uh, as well. And I think it's going to be a partnership between the public sector and the private sector. I think, by the way, there is a first mover advantage in those cities and those businesses uh, that move on this for obvious reasons. And so it's a combination. What we've done in, in London is to have a target to get to zero carbon by 2030 with a roadmap how we get there. And a lot of that is adaptations of our buildings, you're right. So what we've done at the same time is set up a number of funds of money to assist the private sector. So one of those is a London climate financing facility. And another one is the Mayor's Energy Efficiency Fund. And the idea is we leverage in using public sector money, private sector money, innovation, use economies of scale, work with those, for example, those who live in uh, municipal housing there's an opportunity there for, for mass retrofitting in relation to insulation, double glazing, in the walls, solar panels, heat pumps, district heating. Um, and we're also looking into green bonds as well. And I think there's a real opportunity in us going first. Just think about uh, the jobs we could create, you know, in relation to who's going to fit the solar panels, who's going to fit the electric vehicle, vehicle charging points, who's going to fit the double glazing, who's going to yes. do the loft insulation. So we're also working with the skill sector to train up Londoners for these future-proof jobs. I think it's a virtuous circle. And as far as the business community is concerned, uh, we're working with uh, not just Bloomberg's, but many others in, in the city 
about the opportunity for them in relation to if they're in a building that's not the most energy efficient, how you can take action now. And I make this point, Anna, look, the, the, the costs of inaction when it comes to the economy, livelihoods, the environment and the health are far greater than the costs of action in relation to tackling the climate emergency and uh, reducing the toxic air. Uh, do you think that that is a persuasive enough argument to persuade private landlords, for example, to, to put in the necessary investment? That must be quite a challenge in London. You talked about municipal housing. There are, there are clear, clear, clearer pathways, perhaps, to improve that housing stock. But is it harder for, with private rented, uh, that sector? Yeah, it really is. And so I'll give you an idea of the numbers. So in London, uh, about 2.4 million Londoners rent in the private sector. 2.4 million. And, and uh, unless we can incentivise the landlords to take action, you can understand why a tenant, A, can't afford to insulate, but B, there's no incentive. And that's why we're trying to lobby the government to do more in relation to the private landlords, even though the government's announced some policies in, in the budget uh, to assist in relation to zero VAT. If you're a landlord, there's no incentive because you're not paying the, the bigger bills. It's the tenant paying the bigger bills. And so we've got to find a way to deal with the private residential uh, that's that's let out. I think there are easier incentives for owner occupiers. There are easier incentives for local authorities and mm. uh, housing associations that run their properties. But you're right, that part of the jigsaw, mm. we've not quite found a way to incentivise a landlord to take action swifter. Uh, and you mentioned <coughs> the skills gap, and that must be a, a, a concern, I suppose, in a, a labour market that is already stretched, where it's difficult to find builders even with sort of legacy mm. skills, let alone the new ones. So can we can we quickly scale up those skills to, to enable people to find people who can install a heat pump? Yeah, really good question. So one of the things we're doing from uh, City Hall is um, setting up a number of academies in those sectors which you know, we know are future-proof future-proof growth sectors, and the green economy is one of those. We're, we're having green academies across London. We also know in London there's a big issue with underemployment uh, and unemployment, particularly in some communities, particularly, for example, you know, black Londoners aren't having access to the jobs uh, uh, that are available, uh, part, partly lack of access to the skills. And so we're focusing our green academies in those parts of London where we know there's unemployment, underemployment, to give them the skills for the jobs being uh, created. We are experiencing in London in relation to you know employment both a labor shortage and a skills shortage and the reality is look you know uh, we can talk about brexit if you want but I, i'm quite confident uh, around the country many people will still come to the capital city to fulfill their potential and that's why we've got to make sure there is access to the skills which will lead to uh, the jobs our green economy in london's worth 48 billion pounds right uh, the roughly speaking uh, 250,000 jobs in the green economy. We want to double that over the next uh, decade. We want to we want to use this opportunity to create more jobs, mm. and we think we can do it. Uh, you, we've talked about the buildings, and uh, you mentioned transport earlier. Let's focus in on transport a little bit. Uh, I understand that there are some. Well, there are plenty of experiments going on around London, aren't there? Or, or trials going on around London for all sorts of things, different types of charging for vehicles in in in, in various parts of uh, of the capital. Also, uh, road use and different uh, experiments around that. I understand that Waltham Forest is one place where there's quite a lot of uh, experimentation going on. What are we learning? What are the early? Uh, give us some nuggets that we can take away. The early. Learning Learnings yeah. that we're getting from this about what London's <coughs> transport needs to look like 10, 15 years from now. Look, so, so to, to get my job, I've got to persuade Londoners to, to, to vote for me. And one of the things we realised in 2016 is when Londoners are asked about climate change, they think it's a tomorrow issue, but also an issue that doesn't affect them. So what we've done is turn climate change into a now issue by mentioning the health consequences of the environment. And so we know toxic air leads to premature deaths, thousands every year, leads to people having a whole host of health issues from stunted lungs to asthma, dementia, lung disease, cancer. Now, what we've done by doing that is make Londoners uh, be putting pressure on us to take more action because it's an air quality crisis as well as climate change. And great councils like Waltham Forest are, are leading by example. From City Hall, what we've done is we have the world's first ultra-low emission zone. And it started in central London. Uh, and we saw in central London the toxic air reduced by half in just two years. Nitrogen oxide and nitrogen dioxide down by 50%, particulate matter down, carbon down. We've expanded that to inner London. That will lead to further 30% reduction. And we're consulting in May to have all of London one big ultra-low emission zone, working with councils like Waltham Forest, Hackney and others, 
to within their boroughs have zero emission zones and other policies. And the great thing is there's pressure from the people to do more because mm. we've made this into a now issue because it is a health crisis rather than a tomorrow issue, but it's also yeah. an us issue, it affects us in London. Uh, so, but this is difficult work, isn't it? Because even with the ULES and with the, you're thinking of expanding then the ULES uh, even further, even with that, we still have days where your office has to say, look, the air quality is not great out, out there, guys. You know, if, you, if you're at that's risk, progress. Go, go out. Yeah, that's right. progress. So, so in 2016, when I first became mayor, we simply didn't know until the end of the year which days were particularly bad. So working with actually Bloomberg Philanthropies, we now have more air quality monitors across our city than any city in the world. Why is that important? Because <clears throat> what Breathe London has done is we can get real-time information how good or bad things are. Now, <clears throat> anybody here suffers from hay fever, you look at weather forecasts, you know there's a high pollen count, you can take action. Mm. If you've got asthma or other issues, you've got no idea what the air quality is like. So we're letting people have that information so you can then not go for a jog on a, ma a, jog on a main road. You can not push your baby in a buggy on a main road. You can decide not to do things. That information is crucial. What we're doing actually across the, the, the world uh, with the C40 cities is giving them this information with the air quality monitors because the information is really important for you to take action mm. to avoid having the consequences of breathing in this uh, poison. Yeah. Do, do you think that it, uh, the pandemic, you know, it was, a, it was an incredible and, and dreadful event to live through, but it also threw up a lot of opportunities for change and for radical thinking. Do you think that London has taken that opportunity <coughs> to be radical enough when it comes to road use, for example? Right after the pandemic first started, we saw instantly sort of spaces for pedestrians popping up, more space for cyclists yeah, yeah. popping up, segregated <coughs> away from traffic. Is there an opportunity to be more radical, though, on that front, in terms of the, the use that we put these streets to? Well, look, we know the pandemic's uh, been just awful, uh, both in terms of lives lost and livelihoods lost. But I think it was Churchill, who's, a, who's a, 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 maybe have said, never waste a good crisis. And uh, I think it's an opportunity, you're right. We saw during the pandemic uh, uh, air quality improve hugely. We saw during the pandemic people walking and cycling. And so it's um, led to us doing things we otherwise probably may not have had the chance to do. We have uh, uh, quadrupled uh, the amount of cycle lanes in our city now. There are now almost 300, 300 kilometres of safe cycling. We've widened pavements. Uh, we've used the opportunity to do a number of things we probably would have, it would have taken us longer to do. And we've got to think about in a global city where we live, work, play, do leisure, and the pandemics, without a doubt, allowed us to think more about how we see our future. Look, there's, what we're trying to do is you know, grow back greener and build back better. What does that mean? That means making sure we use the opportunity, and again, apologies for using the word opportunity when it comes to a pandemic, an opportunity uh, to go quicker. And what we're doing across the C40, these are the C40, for those that don't know, are 97 cities across the globe, mega cities like the New Yorks, the Limas, the Dakas, the Delhis, the Parises, uh, represent more than 700 million people, uh, more than a quarter of the planet's GDP. Uh, what we're doing is, is across the globe, seeing how we can use this awful pandemic as an opportunity to invest more in the green economies, to have green new deals, uh, to make sure we use this awful opportunity, this pandemic, uh, to make sure we don't go back to business as usual. Mm. What does what you, you've mentioned the C40? So let me linger on that for just a moment. What do, what does London stand to, to to learn from it? Because you've mentioned how we're sharing learning, you're sharing learning from City Hall around Breathe London and around the data that uh, that you're able to act on there. What what do we learn from London? Because I imagine we must be able to tap into experiences elsewhere about what's working. Yeah, great, great, some great stories. I mean, Freetown in Sierra Leone, uh, Yvonne the Mayor, has, uh, you know, got this massive program of tree planting. Uh, and we, we, we're replicating that in, in London because, the, the, you know, in, in Freetown it's important because it stops, you know, mudslides and so forth. But also we know the bi biology in relation to photosynthesis. In Barcelona, aid has got a really good um, street space scheme in relation to using the opportunity created by the pandemic to have less traffic in certain communities, car traffic, and encourage more people to walk and cycle and that sort of pavement cafe uh, uh, culture really, really uh, important. So we've seen in, in North Dakar that they're looking at how they can use the opportunity created by the pandemic to avoid, uh, you know, people coming to the city centre from the coastal areas because of, you know, uh, they're being low line. Uh, and we're working with them about ideas they've got about how they can have high density, good quality housing. So a lot of these uh, 
principles are transferable. Mm. The specific policy may be slightly different, you've got to adjust it, but one of the best things about the, the C40, you know, 97 mayors is we share best practice. There's a lot of bragging as well, I hasten to add, um, as politicians for you. Uh, but we do share pra best practice. So Breathe London is now going Breathe Global. One of the key things we're keen to do as C40, though, is I recognise, we recognise, the global north is responsible for lots of the uh, climate challenges we face. And so what we're going to do is uh, spend more than two thirds of our budget in the global south, it, who are least responsible for climate change, face the biggest consequences and often have the least means. And so mm. we're, we're doing what we can uh, as cities because we're quite nimble, but there's some great ideas uh, around the world that we're trying to, we're trying to pinch. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, pinch and share. Um, it sounds fair enough. Uh, let me ask you about fairness actually, and about social justice, because we've talked a lot about road use and, uh, and the, the way we use the space in London. How do we make sure that it's not just those who've got the loudest voices and the deepest pockets who are able to live a healthier life in London? How do we make sure that, for example, with, um, with the, the low traffic neighborhoods, yeah. that uh, traffic that would have gone through those doesn't go to yeah. the busy roads? You know, what, how do we make sure that nobody's left behind on that? Well, for me, the issue of climate justice is an issue of social justice and racial justice. Why do I say that? Put aside for a second the, um, the uh, macro stuff, Global South, Global North. In London, those least likely to own a car suffer the worst consequences of air pollution. Roughly speaking, half of Londoners don't own a car. Uh, and again, so on a micro level, you're seeing social injustice, but also you're seeing in those communities where there's a higher proportion of black, Asian, minority ethnics have worse air quality, least likely to own a car and so it's an issue of social justice actually uh, and you know uh, it may be inconvenient uh, that you've not been able to take the rat run you used to take you have to go uh, using main roads uh, but for those residents on those roads it's a huge convenience because their children are less likely to suffer from asthma or bronchitis or all sorts of health issues and stuff and so adapt adapting can be short-term inconvenient but in Waltham Forest you mentioned Initially, when they introduced their cycling policies, a lot of resistance from actually mums and dads who were inconvenienced dropping their kids off in the car on the, on, you know, on the rat run. Now those same parents are walking, cycling, scootering with their kids to school. Big improvement in air quality. The businesses in those streets are now benefiting from the higher footfall. Mm. And so that short-term, inverted commas, pain was worth the medium to long-term uh, benefits. Mm. And it's really important to take people with you. And yes. so, you know, we had elections this May, uh, mayoral elections, and uh, you know, on the ballot paper, I was quite clear: if you vote for me, you're voting for a green mayor. If you vote for me, it's more walking and cycling. If you vote for me, it's you know more more ultra low emission zones, etc. And you know, London has voted for me in record numbers. And for some people, those arguments are really persuasive. But what's the most persuasive argument to, to bring along those people who don't initially share the enthusiasm for ultra low emission zones and low transport neighbourhoods? How do you convince them that it is? the right path? Well, the, the evidence helps, and so we point to the evidence about how the ultra low emission zone has led to our air being less toxic, has led to few people suffering uh, from asthma, few people dying uh, prematurely, but also you look at the, 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 the economics of this. Look, we're, London is a Roman village that over a thousand years has expanded and expanded and expanded and expanded. There simply is not enough road space for everyone to jump in their cars, and if we want the roads reserved for those that need to be in the roads, the commercial vehicles, the buses, the black taxis and so forth. You need to get those people off the road who don't need to be there, but the alternative's got to be attractive. So we've got more electric buses than any city in uh, Western Europe, more hydrogen buses, uh, you know, more cycling space, wider pavements, great public transport. Very soon the Elizabeth line will uh, open. And so you've got to make the alternatives more attractive. And we are actually working towards, you mentioned this, Anna, I wasn't ducking it. We're working towards the world's first smart road user charging scheme. It probably won't happen in, in this term. This term will be expanding you, as I hope, to all of London. But actually, uh, you know, if the, if the Pluto pays principle is, is going to be meaningful, you've got to reward good behaviour. So you, you, ch you pay per mile or per kilometre, depending on the vehicle you have, depending where you're driving to and so forth. And I think the future in London is smart road user charging uh, the technology is not quite there. Mm. We, we were the first city in the world to have a congestion charge. We were the first city in the world to have an ultra-low emission zone. 
I think we're going to be the first in the world to have smart, smart road user charging. OK, uh, do submit questions if you would like to. Uh, I believe one of my colleagues is standing by to, uh, to, 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 to pose those to Sadiq uh, on everyone's behalf. So do please keep those coming. I'll just ask one more question to the mayor whilst, uh, whilst we, we, we get some more questions in. You talk about road charging in the sense of charging people to use roads. What about charging infrastructure for those who've decided, look, I want to do the responsible thing. I want to have a more energy efficient car. I want to go and get an electric vehicle. Uh, and, and then they find it's very difficult to yeah. charge them and the yeah. infrastructure around that lets them down. I mean, you, you, is this just an example of where you, know, you don't have all the levers at your disposal that perhaps you would like to make gr uh, London a greener place, um, Sadiq? But w w what would you like to see in terms of that charging infrastructure? So let me say the good news about London. I can't speak for uh, the rest of the country, but in London now we have more rapid charging points. A rapid charging point means you can charge a car in 10, 15 minutes rather than seven, eight hours. We have more rapid charging points than any city in Western Europe. We're approaching 500 now. And you can get an app and see where the rapid charging points are. We now have almost 10,000 normal charging points uh, across our city, uh, which is about a third of the country's uh, charging points. Um, what we've noticed, though, if you do a sort of bird's eye view of London, not all of London is well covered. So outer London is not as well covered as central London. Uh, and there are some corridors that have more than others. So we're trying to improve that. We've set up, uh, it's an awful phrase, an electric vehicle infrastructure task force. I know it's, uh, I wasn't <laughs> responsible. Um, but we're working with the private sector. Uh, we're working with utility companies to make sure we have all of London covered. But also we're making sure that the uh, energy you're using is renewable. Uh, it's really important. And also we use the opportunity, TfL, TfL, Transport London, is the biggest purchaser of uh, electricity in the, in, in the city. We're also entering into a power purchase agreement to make sure it's renewable renewable stuff we're uh, using uh, as well. But, you know, you can be confident in London with an electric vehicle, and we're working with the government to give more confidence up the motorways and stuff, because obviously there's a real nervousness uh, in relation to, you know, driving your electric mm. vehicle around the country. Yeah. OK, let's see if we have uh, any questions coming through. Meg. Yeah, so uh, the first one is about C40 and asking more specifically how city mayors and the private sector can work together to drive climate action in C40. Yeah, good question. So C40, we do actually work incredibly close with the private sector. We, had, we announced that in Glasgow a billion pounds worth of private sector money to um, electrify the buses in South America. And we're doing more and more, more, and more work with the private sector because what we're keen to do across the C40 is to make sure all cities who want to have a Green New Deal and let's be, let's be frank, in the, in the current climate, uh, many mayoralties and national governments are short of funds. And by leveraging in the, in the private sector, we can, you know, not work in silos, but, but do much, much more. And my view is this, look, not, there are negative reasons why the private sector want to get involved. Nobody likes economic upheaval. Nobody likes high insurance costs. Nobody likes, uh, you know, the, the, the issues that, that come about from flash flooding and so forth. So rather than a negative reason for the private sector to get involved, there's a positive reason, which is, you know, can-do mayors. And I think, you know, can-do private sector working with can-do mayors are, are the solution to some of the challenges we face. And actually, just like for, for mayors and cities, there's, there's a first mover advantage. For businesses, there's a first mover advantage as well. We're, we're doing green bonds, so get involved in that. The, the clean London, you know, uh, financing facility, get involved in that. And other cities around uh, the world um, are doing similar things. Uh, what is London doing to prepare for higher sea levels and more common flash flooding? Yeah. So one of the things that we, we, we've got to get our mind around as a country is when you speak to the Environment Agency and they think about floods, they think about floods from the river or from the sea. But actually we saw last summer flash floods in the city because of the hard surface mm. uh, and so forth. Uh, we had stations closing down, we had uh, basements being flooded, uh, we had Londoners' lives being disrupted. So. The, the upside of these awful problems is it becomes a now problem. And so there's, you know, people get why we've got to deal with flash flooding. So we're working with the water companies, we're working with uh, local authorities. We've now got more sustainable uh, urban drainage. We're trying to turn, you know, you know concrete jun jungles green. We're planting, I planted another tree yesterday. We're planting trees across <laughs> uh, our city. I feel like the queen, the amount of trees I plant. Um, uh, uh, but yeah. And so we've got to think about, because cities are facing flash flooding, but also we're facing another phenomenon, which is overheating. Uh, so we've got to make sure there are cool parts of our city. We've, we've mapped out our city now in relation to flash flooding now. But over the next 10 years, the bad news is, over the next 10 years in London, a quarter of our tubes and stations will be flooded if no action is taken. Hundreds of thousands of homes can be, uh, will be flooded. And many of our hospitals 
uh, could be flooded. And by the way, they're in the poorer parts of our city. And this is all by rain? All by rain. And you're taking action to, to protect schools, I understand. Absolutely. From this. It's really important, yeah. And it's an issue of, you know, mapping out where the inverted commas problem areas are and then taking action to address those green walls, green roofs, planting more trees, sustainable urban drainage, making sure we have, there's a reason why, you know, we're expanding the, 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 the sewers underneath the city that many of us don't ever experience and stuff because we need to, we need to increase capacity. Look, uh, across the globe, uh, urbanisation means there are more and more people moving to cities, not per se a bad thing as long as we plan for it. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much to Mayor Sadiq Khan. Thanks very much for listening. Thank you.